I have a uh, statement on Germany and Berlin. I'll read a, a few uh, paragraphs of it, and uh, it will be available for distribution right after the press conference. The Soviet aid memoir is a document which speaks of peace but threatens to disturb it. It speaks of ending the abnormal situation in Germany but insists on making permanent its abnormal division. It refers to the four power alliance of World War II but seeks the unilateral abrogation of the rights of the other three powers. It calls for new international agreements while preparing to violate existing ones. It offers certain assurances while making it plain that its previous assurances are not to be relied upon. It professes concern for the rights of the citizens of West Berlin while seeking to expose them to the immediate or eventual domination of a regime which permits no self-determination. Three simple facts are clear. One, today there is peace in Berlin, in Germany, and in Europe. If that peace is destroyed by the unilateral actions of the Soviet Union, its leaders will bear a heavy responsibility before world opinion and history. Two, the people of West Berlin are free. In that sense, it's already a free city, free to determine its own leaders and free to enjoy the fundamental human rights reaffirmed in the United Nations Charter. Three, today the continued presence in West Berlin of the United States, the United Kingdom, and France is by clear legal right arising from war, acknowledged in many agreements signed by the Soviet Union and strongly supported by the overwhelming majority of the people of that city. Their freedom is dependent upon the exercise of these rights, an exercise which is thus a political and moral obligation as well as a legal right. Inasmuch as these rights, including the right of access to Berlin, are not held from the Soviet government, they cannot be ended by any unilateral action of the Soviet Union. They cannot be affected by a so-called, quote, peace treaty, unquote, covering only a part of Germany with a regime of the Soviet Union's own creation, a regime which is not freely representative of all or any part of Germany and does not enjoy the confidence of the 17 million East Germans. The steady stream of German refugees from east to west is eloquent testimony to this fact. The real intent of the June 4 aid memoir is that East Berlin, a part of a city under four power status, would be formally absorbed into the so-called German Democratic Republic, while West Berlin, even though called a, quote, free city, unquote, would lose the protection presently provided by the Western powers and become subject to the will of a totalitarian regime. Its leader, Herr Albrecht, has made clear his intention once this so-called peace treaty is signed to curb West Berlin's communications with the free world and to suffocate the freedom it now enjoys. The world knows that there is no reason for a crisis over Berlin today and that if one develops, it will be caused by the Soviet Union's and their government's attempt to invade the rights of others and manufacture tensions. A city does not become free merely by calling it a free city. For a city or a people to be free requires that they be given the opportunity without economic, political, or police pressure to make their own choice and live their own lives. The people of West Berlin today have that freedom. It is the objective of our policy that they will continue to enjoy it. Peace does not come automatically from a, quote, peace treaty, unquote. There is peace in Germany today, even though the situation is abnormal. 
a peace treaty that adversely affects the lives and rights of millions will not bring peace with it. A peace treaty that attempts to affect adversely the solemn commitments of three great powers will not bring peace with it. We again urge the Soviet government to reconsider its course, to return to the path of constructive cooperation it so frequently states it desires, and to work with its World War II allies in concluding a just and enduring settlement of issues remaining from that conflict. Secondly, uh, preliminary estimates of the gross national product in the second quarter of this year have been completed. The nation's output of goods and services rose sharply to an annual rate of $515 billion, a $14 billion increase over the first quarter, reversing three consecutive quarters of decline. Total personal income has risen steadily. In June, it reached nearly $417 billion, $10.5 billion above its recession low of last February. And as you know, the Federal Reserve Index Board of Production increased two points in June to reach a level of 110. There are still, however, serious problems with unemployment in this country. As I said some time ago, unemployment is bad enough when there's a recession, but it's intolerable when there is prosperity. And I believe it important, therefore, that the country, the administration, the Congress, remember as we move into a period of advance that there are still five million Americans who are unemployed, a million who are employed part-time, and we have to develop programs and actions that will make it easier for them uh, to secure their jobs. And finally, as you know, I had hoped to be able to attend the forthcoming meeting of the Inter-American Inter Economic and Social Council at Montevideo. However, during early August, the Congress will be dealing with many of the most important issues of this session including the foreign aid bill itself. Therefore, I consider it in the best interest of the Alliance for Progress that I remain here and work for those proposals on which our Latin American program and indeed our future relations with the entire free world so largely depend. The delegation that I'm sending to Montevideo will be led by Secretary of the Treasury Dillon and will consist of high-level responsible people from other departments of the government. They carry with them proposals to which I have given a good deal of personal attention and which has occupied the attention of the government for some months, and which will, I believe and hope, mark an historic turning point in the life of the Americas. Our task at Montevideo will be to build the framework of procedures and goals within which we can construct an American community of democratic states moving towards a better life for their people. This conference is the most important international gathering since the beginning of this administration, for on its success very largely depends the future of freedom in this hemisphere. Mr. President, are you now considering a declaration of national emergency, limited or otherwise, in order to call up National Guard or Reserve units? We are uh, concluding uh, this afternoon our uh, review of uh, what actions we might take uh, towards uh, strengthening the uh, military position of the United States. Uh, those uh, decisions uh, will be uh, brought to the attention of our allies this week who are also uh, bear heavy responsibilities in this area. They will uh, be uh, part of a, a speech which I will make uh, to the country uh, next Tuesday evening and will be presented to the Congress uh, a week from today. And at that time, uh, the, the details uh, of what we now plan to do will uh, be made public. Mr. President, Mr. President. Yeah. Uh, some months ago, you suggested that our uh, allies could contribute to Western security by uh, increasing the strength of their conventional forces. Uh, since then, nothing much seems to have happened in this direction. Could you tell us whether you're satisfied with the pace of developments in this field? We will uh, this week uh, be uh, talking with our allies about uh, what we intend to do, and uh, we will also uh, have uh, consultations with them about what we can in common do. There is going to be a uh, foreign uh, minister's conference in uh, early August in Paris, which will be uh, preceded by uh, 
preliminary consultations, and at that time, uh, this will be uh, one of the matters which will be before the foreign minister. We uh, have the problem of uh, concerting our activities with 14 other countries. Napoleon once said that he won all his successes because he fought allies. We are anxious that uh, we make the uh, consultation between our allies on all these questions, military, political, information, uh, economic, that we try to work out uh, procedures which will permit a uh, close harmony in the actions of all the countries which bear responsibility as uh, members of NATO. And therefore, in answer to your question, we will be uh, discussing, this will be one of the subjects which will be discussed in the next two weeks. Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, in the note on Berlin yesterday, it was said on, se in, on several occasions that we are not wedded to the present situation in Berlin. In view of that, are we now planning to take an active lead in bringing about orderly and beneficial developments on Berlin? And specifically, uh, how do you look upon the idea of an international peace conference on this city? The, uh, the statement of yesterday plus the statement of today uh, represents uh, uh, the view I, I want to express at this time on uh, Germany and Berlin, and uh, other views will be expressed, of course, as the uh, time moves on, but uh, this is where I stand for the present. Mr. President, uh, if your proposals for meeting the Berlin situation require a substantial additional defense outlays, uh, would you favor a taxing to pay for this rather than adding it to a deficit spending. The uh, Senate Majority Whip has suggested that uh, we ought to meet this kind of cost with higher taxes. The, uh, as you know, uh, our budget, uh, if the economy uh, is proceeding at a uh, what we uh, hope will be a uh, steady rate of growth, the present tax structure would uh, bring in very substantial uh, resources. Uh, I think we discussed at a previous uh, conference that that tax structure is so strong that it helped uh, contributed to strangling the recovery after the 58 recession. Therefore, the judgment on taxes and on uh, expenditures uh, will be made in light of uh, what will uh, produce the best economic situation for the United States in the coming months. We will uh, make it clear at the time that uh, we complete our uh, review and our announce them as to what exactly we propose on taxes. I will suggest, however, while we're on it, that both the previous administration and this administration recommended nearly $840 million of tax increase in uh, postal uh, payments. That uh, amount has been steadily scaled down, and yet we've been unable to get a vote on the House of Representatives on the issue, and uh, no hearings have been held in the Senate. This is a matter which I think I'm hopeful the Congress will deal with, because it represents the uh, an agreement between this administration and the last administration that we should not permit nearly a billion dollars in deficit in the Postal Service. And as a bill has just passed the Senate providing increased benefits for the employees, which will add another 60 or 70 million dollars to the deficit, which will take it over a billion dollars if passed and signed by the President. So that uh, here is at least one area preliminary to a decisive answer to your question, which will come in the next few days, that I think we should move on. President. Morgan. The uh, whole bundle of your school legislation was torpedoed in the House Rules Committee yesterday, and it's clear that uh, uh, one of the things that largely helped to sink it was the religious issue. Will you discuss that problem, including the report that uh, you have just about given up on passing school legislation in this first session of this Congress? Well, I know that uh, we were uh, defeated in the Rules Committee by a vote of 8 to 7. Uh, and. Uh, I will say that uh, seven out of those eight votes came from uh, members of uh, Congress who uh, were not sympathetic to the legislation or did, uh, supported me in the last election. Uh, they have, of course, their responsibility to meet. But the fact of the matter is that there are procedures available to the House of Representatives to uh, adopt this bill in spite of the action of yesterday uh, before the session ends. Now, the Senate passed it by a generous majority. And uh, it came out of the House committee with uh, support. I consider it to be uh, probably the uh, most important piece of domestic legislation. I'm hopeful that the members of Congress who support this will use those procedures which are available to them under the rules of the House to bring this to a vote, and that a majority of the members of Congress will support it. Every uh, study that we make indicates the need for the legislation. There is broad general support, in my opinion, for improving our educational system. 
Anyone who has a child wants that child to be educated to the extent of its talents. This program is most important. In addition, included within that bill is uh, a provision for the so-called impacted areas. And uh, the uh, July 1st date is passed, and they, those impacted areas are uh, working on an emergency basis. So I feel that the impacted area part should stay in this bill, that it should be, I'm hopeful, considered by the House, and that a majority of the members will vote A or nay on it. Now, uh, this matter has been involved. Uh, education is a very important uh, part of uh, the life of this country, and there are strong feelings. Uh, the matter of religion has been brought into it. Other issues have. My view is that assistance for public education should be passed by this session. I'm hopeful a majority of the members of the House will agree, because I think it would be a most important step forward. And I'm confident that uh, Congressman Thompson and others in the House, Senator Moss and the Senate who've been working on it, will continue to use all of their energies uh, to uh, get this bill by. I would sign it with the greatest possible pleasure. President, Mr. Lauren? could you uh, give us a broad estimate of approximately how much more defense funds you might be asking next week? No, uh, uh, Mr. Lawrence, uh, we are meeting in the National Security Council this afternoon at which a, a final judgment will be reached. Uh, we do have a uh, obligation to communicate our views to uh, particularly those who are involved with us in uh, Berlin, and uh, it will be presented to the Congress uh, early next week and uh, to the American people early next week. Mr. President, will you give us your view of the Freedom Riders movement? Well, the, I think the Attorney General has made it clear that we believe that everyone uh, who uh, travels, for whatever reason they travel, should enjoy the full uh, constitutional uh, protections uh, given to them by uh, the law and uh, by the Constitution. They should be able to move freely in interstate commerce. Now, uh, I'm hopeful that that will become the generally accepted view, and if there are any legal doubts about the right of people to move in interstate commerce, uh, that, that, will, uh, uh, that, those, uh, that legal position will be clarified. We naturally uh, want those rights to be developed in a way which will permit them to be lasting and which will permit them to meet the needs of those people who, uh, have, uh, who wish to travel. I don't, in my judgment, there's no question of the legal rights of the uh, freedom, travel, uh, freedom Riders to move in interstate commerce. And uh, those rights, whether we agree with uh, those who travel, whether we agree with the purpose for which they travel, those rights uh, uh, stand, uh, providing uh, they are exercised in a peaceful way. We may not like what people print in the paper, but there's no question of their constitutional right to print it. So that uh, that follows, in my opinion, uh, for those who move in interstate commerce. So that uh, without uh, the basic question is that not the freedom riders. The basic question is that anyone who moves to interstate commerce should be able to do so freely. That's the more substantive question, not the question merely of the freedom riders. Mr. President, Mr. President yes. in your consideration of the military requirements now in dealing with the Berlin situation and of the Allied military reevaluation, are you basing your judgment on the assumption that it is conceivable that we might fight a ground war in Europe over Berlin? I'm uh, making uh, my judgment on what I consider to be uh, the uh, relative uh, power balance between uh, the uh, communist bloc and ourselves, the attitude which the uh, communist bloc is now taking, uh, and uh, what uh, possible needs we might have in uh, protecting our uh, commitments and vital interests. I think that uh, we have to uh, realize that we are, uh, our commitments are far flung. We are operate at the end of a long supply line. And uh, others, in some cases, operate at the end of a short supply line. All this indicates the uh, needs, uh, the uh, very uh, heavy burdens placed upon uh, this country. We have commitments in Southeast Asia, and we have commitments in Berlin. And uh, we are uh, being uh, very vigorously challenged. Now, in answer to your question, the, uh, I think that uh, we will make public, uh, and you can make perhaps a better calculation after we give our figures. And as I said before, those figures should not be discussed, in my opinion, until at least those who share this burden with us have a chance to, to be informed. This alliance, NATO alliance, is going to move through very difficult uh, periods in the coming months. 
Uh, every uh, country uh, has its own uh, strategic and tactical problems and uh, carries particular burdens, which other countries do not. If this alliance is going to move in concert, in my opinion, we have to improve our consultation. It took us, as uh, you know, uh, some time before we were able to come to a conclusion on the language of the aid memoir. We're going to have to improve our consultation so that we can come to decisions more quickly. But I think we should realize, as anyone who has studied the uh, history of alliances, how enormous a task it is to have uh, 15 countries uh, moving down a stream uh, all together over an issue which involves the security of them all. So uh, we will inform them and then the Congress of what we plan to do, and the Congress will make the final judgment. Can't. Can you give us uh, some details of the speech that you plan for the nation next Tuesday? The uh, speech will be a... Uh, discussion of uh, what our responsibilities are and what uh, our hazards are and uh, what uh, I think we sh the situation appears to be at the present time, what its uh, consequences could be and uh, what uh, we must do and what our allies must do to uh, move through not merely uh, the present difficulties, but uh, I would say uh, we have to look forward to many uh, challenges in the coming months and years so that uh, We'll try to discuss at least what the general problem that the United States faces in the security field in the summer of 1961. Not merely that tied to Berlin, but generally. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President uh, could you tell us whether uh, uh, the uh, space program, the uh, launching of a man into orbit, uh, is going to come uh, a bit faster than we might have expected in view of the fact that a, uh, a second uh, short uh, ballistic flight uh, was scheduled for today. I don't know whether it's come Yes, I'm not familiar with that there's been any step up in the previously announced uh, schedule. If there has been, I'll speak to Mr. Webb, but I, as I understood it, it was at the end of this year that we were talking about the orbit, but that uh, may not be a precise date now. I have to look into it. Hello. Ms. Craig? Uh, although the Ms. White Craig. House has commented on the... I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Craig, and then we'll Thank you. Mr. President, many countries receiving foreign aid from us are concerned because their expanding populations nullify the aid. The President of Pakistan referred to this in his speech to the joint session of Congress and also in his speech at the press club. Since you are asking billions of dollars more in foreign aid, will you help countries control their expanding populations if they ask you. The, uh, I've said uh, before, uh, Ms. Craig, uh, that uh, this is a decision which goes very much to the uh, life of a country, and uh, it is a personal decision and a national decision which these nations must make. The problem is not uh, altogether an uh, economic one. It's a, uh, we help countries which carry out different policies in this regard. And it's a judgment, in my opinion, which they should make. Mr. President, all oh, the White House has commented on the fact that Under Secretary of State Bowles is remaining in his job at this time. There still remains some doubt as to your own confidence in him, sir, and your own ideas on how the administration of the State Department is proceeding. Yes, well, I've, uh, in the first place, I've never, uh, contrary to some reports, uh, never uh, asked Mr. Bowles for his resignation, or has he ever offered it. I have uh, always expected that he would be a part of this administration until it uh, concluded its responsibilities. I have a high regard uh, for Mr. Bowles. He was my advisor on foreign policy uh, last year. And uh, all my conversations with uh, the members of the State Department, the members of the Defense Department, and the members of the intelligence community have gone to the question of how we can best organize our talents and, our, and the White House how we can best organize our talents so that uh, everyone is being used in a way which uh, makes maximum use of their abilities. Now, that when Mr. General Taylor was appointed, it was regarded as a, a diminution of the responsibilities of the Joint Chief, which it is not. But it came about uh, as a result of uh, conversations between the Joint Chiefs and uh, Secretary McNamara. We have the Killian Committee now examining the structure of the uh, intelligence community. We have been talking about how we can uh, make more effective uh, the structure and the personnel of the State Department. We'll continue to do so. And uh, because they're faced with unprecedented hazards. As I said, the, when Mr. Rusk is going to be meeting at the foreign ministers on a very vital question, Berlin, Secretary Dillon will be meeting at Montevideo. And this puts great burdens on the Department of State, which is the arm of the president in foreign policy. 
Mr. Bowles has my complete confidence. He uh, is going on, uh, on the trip, uh, which will take him to Africa and Asia and consulting with heads of states and with allies. And uh, I expect that his trip will be most valuable, and I'm confident that everyone who talks to him, Americans or uh, heads of other states, will recognize that Mr. Bowles will be, I hope, a valuable part of this administration as long as it continues and that he has the confidence of the President and the Secretary of State. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, does your answer mean that there is a possibility that he may be shifted, though, to some other responsibility more in keeping with his talents? There, uh, we have reached no judgment on how we're going to organize any of these departments of people. I put the general principle forward that we are going to attempt to maximize the uh, abilities of everyone working in the government. If I came to the conclusion that uh, Mr. Bowles could be more effective in another responsible position, I would not hesitate to ask him to take that position. And I'm confident Mr. Bowles would not hesitate to take it. My judgment is now that he should stay as Under Secretary of State. And if there's going to be any change, I'll make it very clear at the time. But he will continue as Under Secretary of State, and I have no plan to uh, ask him to assume a new responsibility. But any time I think that he or anyone else in the administration can do their job better in another way, I will certainly ask him because as long as uh, I'm going to bear the responsibility of the presidency, I'm going to attempt to make sure that it's implemented to the best at least of my ability. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, Congressman Powell said yesterday, sir, that it's your, that it's your intention <coughs> to veto any bill that may be passed for aid to education in federally impacted areas unless a general federal aid bill is approved. Uh, would you veto a bill for impacted areas if the general aid bill is defined? My judgment is that the impacted school bill should be a part of general public assistance, and that's the position of the administration. And therefore, I'm hopeful that the members of Congress who are anxious to secure the passage of this legislation should also recognize that we are not meeting our responsibilities if we merely pass the impacted area, but we should pass them both together. And that's what we're working to doing. As far as what action we would take, of course, we have to wait till the Congress has has uh, made its judgment. But my view is that the best way to secure the passage of that bill is to treat this as a unit, which I believe it is. Mr. Yes? In, in your reply to the Soviet aid memoir, you stressed several times the lack of the right of self-determination among the peoples of Eastern Europe. And within the week, you issued a proclamation looking to the freedom of the captive nation. Can you conceive, in the event of any popular uprisings in Eastern Europe, of a more active role for the United States in support of those uprisings than was the case in Hungary in 1956. I think that uh, I'll stand on the statement which we made at this time. Mr. President, yeah. you, personally, you personally favor passage of uh, aid to private schools as part of the National Defense Education Act as part of the school package which Congress should enact this year. Well, as you know, uh, the uh, in the bill which we sent to the Congress continued the previous assistance given to non-public schools, which were for certain technical and defense, uh, to meet certain technical and defense requirements. There, uh, the uh, Office of HEW, I think, indicated to the House Committee that the amendments which they added were not unconstitutional, whether they are uh, in uh, public policy or not, and whether that would affect the final passage would be a judgment we would reach. They're not unconstitutional because they do not go across the board in a way in which my opinion is clearly unconstitutional. But the program which we support and which we hope the Congress will pass was the program we sent up there. Now, the Congress has to make its judgment on those bills. But uh, in my judgment, the best bills were the ones that uh, and the most effective in meeting the problem was the legislation that we sent up there. Mr. President, yeah, Mr. Okay. Mr. President uh, Soviet Ambassador Menchikov is reported to have said that he did not think the United States people were either prepared or ready to go to war over Berlin. Do you think Ambassador Menchikov is sending back a correct assessment of the mood and temper of the American people? Well, I saw that this report came out of some uh, function. I don't know how accurate it is and uh, whether that represents Mr. Menchikov's view, but I don't think that it's possible that uh, anyone uh, could uh, read the aid memoir or the other statements which have been made by other governments and this government without realizing that this is a very basic issue, this question of West Berlin, and that uh, we uh, intend to honor our commitments. Uh, Tomorrow, as you doubtless know, marks the end of your first six months in the presidency. <coughs> the view of uh, Laos, Cuba, and now Berlin. I wonder if there's anything you'd care to tell us about the vicissitudes of the presidency. 
Uh, well, I will say that uh, we've had a, uh, I think I said in the uh, State of the Union address about the news will be worse instead of it's better. I would also say that uh, Mr. Khrushchev would probably agree with that. Uh, I, uh, in the sense that uh, I think we are always conscious of the difficulties that we have, but there are a good many difficulties which should be taken into calculation in considering uh, future uh, block actions, uh, considering their own problems, whether it's the food shortage in China or the difficulties in uh, other parts of the uh, block empire, relations between uh, certain block countries and all the rest. Now, as far as the United States, we've been pleased with the progress we've made internally. As far as the economy, the progress the country has made, we do feel we still have this problem of uh, rather chronic unemployment. We are, I'm glad that, we, uh, that some of these bills, which have been discussed for a number of years, have passed. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can add education to that and long-term borrowing authority for foreign aid. Uh, my judgment is that the American people and this government and the Congress must realize that we're in a uh, long struggle, which we'll be, invo we'll be involved with for a great many years against very powerful countries nearly a billion people in them with uh, strong economies in some cases and that uh, we cannot look for success on every occasion. But I think if we have the patience and willingness to uh, take uh, some setbacks without uh, taking uh, unwise actions and recognizing that uh, there are also other successes which uh, may not be as dramatic to us but uh, certainly are come within Mr. Khrushchev's calculations that we can move through this period, I hope, protecting our vital interests and our commitments and also maintain the peace, but no one should think that it's going to be easy. Thank you, President. <laughs>